warning. This episode contains strong language. I know you're, you're happy. I mean, I know you're happy with it, but was there anything you would have said, you know what, I wish they would have maybe brought this in for my story, or I wish they would have maybe stuck this in or something like that? Well, um, I mean, I know that what works in comics does not necessarily work in real life. So yeah. I mean, when I'm able to do a comic, I'm not limited by budget. I'm not limited by, you know, anything as far as uh, creative control is concerned. I just basically just go all out and do whatever the heck I want, you know, and I say, well, this works for the story. I'll just go ahead and do this. But I understand the, the limitations of doing anything in live action, especially if you're going to do something, you know, that you want people to take seriously you know, do you want people to enjoy? You want to reach all sorts of uh, uh, audience, you know? And uh, I was actually very pleased. It really captured, you know, the least the tone and the feel of the original comic book. Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Okay, we have a very special guest today, Ben Dunn. Love that name too, first of all, Ben Dunn, right? Just, just I've been done. I would be using that all the time. Um, really great guy, okay? You've seen his work, may not have known it. Um, yeah, Netflix, The Warrior Nun. You heard of that show? You know, amazing. Very cool show. He is a comic book artist, and his comic book series, they turned that into that Netflix series that has uh, been renewed for another season. So they're going to be coming back for more. It's just, you know, a whole canon of of stuff to go from. Um, so it was really cool talking to uh, Ben, our very first comic book uh, artist on the show. Um, so really cool. We've had several people on with, you know, series on Netflix and, and stuff like that. Um, but this was the first, like this sort of thing, right? So th this was really, really cool. Um, you know, we talked about comic books and some of that stuff. And again, you know, I'm coming from an angle of, I don't, I know a little bit, but not too much, right? definitely not anywhere near what someone that reads comics on a daily basis. I mean, I'm talking like eighties, nineties stuff that I used to read when I was a kid. All right, so uh, just really cool. We just had a cool conversation. Let's talk about Japanese comic book that has, it's a whole different art form. It's got its own name, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, own style and everything and how he mixed, you know, his, it, to get his style. Uh, really cool. Really, and the struggle that it took uh, to get it to Netflix, right? That story, you know, it wasn't overnight, guys. Okay, this has been a long journey, decades in the making, really. Um, so really cool, you know, fantastic story, fantastic guy. Um, you know, so yeah, that, so he's most known for Ninja High School and, uh, you know, that the warrior nut. Um, so yes, um, really, really cool. Just again, really, really, I just really enjoyed, uh, this conversation. We talked a little bit about, um, tacos too, a little bit because he's from San Antonio, so, you know, and I'm in Austin, so there's a little bit of breakfast taco. If you know it, if you know what I'm talking about, a little breakfast taco, who's is better, you know, we'll just, you know, leave it at that, Austin. We'll just leave it at that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to be biased, Austin. I'm just saying it's, you know, could be San Antonio, but it's, it's Austin. So anyway, <laughs> Ben's like, this mother. Okay. Uh, all right. So yeah, really cool conversation. Ben Dunn. Really excited, and please go check out the Netflix series if you haven't already. Um, it's a great, great series. Phil, humor, it's just got everything, you know, powers, magic, superhero stuff, right? Just, just everything, really, really cool. Uh, and they filmed it in Spain, right? And you guys know how much I love Spain. Um, so they went there, he got to go visit the set, you know, all that sort of stuff, just, just amazing. Just super great story. What, what an inspirational guy and um you know again another another guest where we can learn something from just like i don't know about you guys but all these guests all these people i talk to i'm just completely inspired by they just do all these amazing things and i like finding out how they got there and what they're doing you know it's like because i want to do that stuff right i want to i i want to do amazing things in life um i always try to so like this podcast i do for you guys 
It's amazing. So anyway, yeah, and it's not just me, right? It's the whole team, uh, you know, behind there. I wish everybody could be here that, that actually works on the podcast, be on at the same time too, so you guys can see everybody, hear everybody, and know. Yeah, I bet they hate that I'm the voice of the podcast, right? Like I speak for them. I don't speak for them, but you know what I mean? Uh, you know, people probably assume I do. But I don't. Anyway, all right. So before we get to the episode with Ben, uh, don't forget to check out our website, thelonestarplate.com. And as always, thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We really appreciate it. Please do that. Please tell a friend. Uh, you know, hey, guys, you got to check out this awesome podcast with this awesome host. He's awesome. I'm awesome for telling you. You could be awesome, too, for listening to it. So, right? So so do that. Um, and don't forget, we're on Spotify, you know, um, <laughs> that's it. I just Spotify. We're on YouTube. You know, Google Podcast now has a thing out. Amazon is has podcast out. Everywhere's got podcasts, guys. So you know, no excuses. Um, and on YouTube, we do this cool thing where we break down the podcast into these little clips because we film it, right? So we do these on Zoom, and there's video. So uh, that's pretty cool. You can see the person, see me, and um, you know, not that that's exciting, but whatever. Uh, the person that, that you know, our guest, that that's exciting. See them. So anyway, check it out pretty cool stay in touch all right let's get to the episode been done i've been done with this intro a long time ago so let's get to the episode <laughs> all right been done warrior nun the man okay enjoy i am i, I cannot tell you how excited i am to talk to you my man <laughs> the pleasure is all mine thank you very much i am just uh i'm fascinated I'm fascinated by things I don't understand all the way. Uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right, right. It's like, okay, well, now I can learn about this. Um, absolutely, it, right. It, it's Always something ongoing. Absolutely, right. It's a learning. Uh, you learn all the way through life, of course. Um, yeah, you, you know, Ben, you've, you do, right, your comic book publisher. Is that the best way to describe you? How, what do you tell people when you meet, when you meet them? When they say, what do you do, Ben? What, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, most I, just, yeah, I draw comics for a living, and that's about it. <laughs> lo- lo- says it all, right? That's it. That's perfect. Okay, well, I love it. I love that. Yeah, and what I love um, is when I was a kid, I used to love, I was, man, I was really into comic books a lot. Actually, really into, like, um, the the Batman, the Dark Knight. I remember getting this big book, a Frank Miller book, it, even when I was a kid in the 80s. I don't know why my father got me that, but he got it, he got it for me. Um I was just fascinated by it, right? The, it was a different time back then, um, as well as far as what you could take in and what the resources were where you could get things, right? Now there's the internet and of course everything's accessible, but it didn't always used to be like that. And comic books were this thing that you could get and read with your friends. And it was all, even the Ninja Turtles, I saw you were inspired by that. I was a big fan of those comics too when I was a kid. Um, you know, in the early nineties, uh, you know, it's just fascinating. So gosh, it's just, I'm sorry, I'm rambling here. There's so much I want to talk about, but I'm just trying to explain what I, my first question, what I want to get to is what I want to start with is what are the differences in comic books, right? There's different types of, of styles, I guess, drawings. I, I don't know how, how would you describe it, Ben, as far as the different styles go? Well, yeah, I mean, comic books are unique, an art form, you know, as American art form that um, <clears throat> definitely took off during the uh, early, uh, late 30s, you know, and co- exists even today. You know, it certainly has a wide range uh, world influence. I mean, people, I mean, comics are basically in, um, based in stories with pictures, yeah, and that's a... Uh, you can't really get much more basic than that than just the printed word. You know, people yeah. like to uh, uh, see drawings because it tells a story, and that's how. You, uh, hmm? Yes. What about what about the like the the writing in the comic book? Is that normally separated where two people do that, or is it normally one person handles all of it? They draw and uh, they well, it, it depends, you know. Um, <laughs> if everybody could draw, then uh, that would be great, you know. But uh, <laughs> uh, I always say that uh, one of the things about comics is that, uh, you know, the art will draw people in, but it's the story that keeps people coming back. You know, I mean, you can have really fantastic art on a comic book, but if the stories are not interesting, you're not going to really 
uh, keep an audience uh, hooked to it. You know, so yeah, a story is probably the most important thing. It's the foundation for everything as far as comics are concerned. Sure. So if you don't have a good foundation, then the, the structure isn't going to last. Yeah, that makes, I mean, that makes 100% uh, sense, just like a good film or a good television show, right, or, or any of that. Um, what, what about, like, I keep hearing this word, because I've had some friends, I still have some friends that, that are into this, I, I'm, I'm going to butcher the word, I'll just spell it, it's like M-A-N-G-A, is that right? Yeah, it's Ma- called manga. Manga. Or- Manga. Okay. Manga. Okay. Yeah. Manga. okay. Just you know, I want to say that right. Uh, what, <laughs> you, you, got it. you got it. <laughs> what what is what does that mean exactly? And what uh, yeah, what does that mean? Uh well I'm not I'm not quite certain what the root of the word is from, but apparently it's uh, pretty much the Japanese word for comic book or some sort of uh, drawing with story. Um, oh, okay. That's yeah, it. That's it's, it's just basically it. another word for comic. You know, Got as it. far as I know, it's just the Japanese word for it. Uh, like I said, I don't know where the root comes from or sure. where it originated, but it's usually a, a phrase. I mean, it's a word that usually differentiates uh, a comic drawn in a sort of Japanese style. Got it. Okay. Because uh, there's a French word, manja, is, that means to eat, which is strange. I thought, well, that, that's interesting. Um, I love how languages all work together. I thought, well, you eat oh, yeah. you know, you're taking in the, the information, but that's funny. It just literally means uh, comic. Like, yeah, I thought yeah, it I had know, some. Uh, you never know. Name, so, like when I watch like you know science fiction movies or something like that, when you go to a planet, every single person on that planet speaks the exact same language. You know, and <laughs> here on Earth, we have like what thousands and hundreds of languages. You know, that's a great yeah. point. I never <laughs> thought about that. That's a great point. That that is funny. That's hilarious. That is funny. Well, um, okay. So how would you describe your comic books? What, in what style would they be? Well, I, I just, I'm pretty much a person who just is like a chameleon. I just like whatever style it you know, strikes me at the moment. I try to uh, pick and, you know, what uh, I like about it and incorporate it into my own work. You know, I, I grew up work, reading American comic books, and, uh, but I went overseas uh, to Asia, and that's where I discovered manga back in the 70s, and it was something unique. I had never seen it before. I loved the uh, style, so I started adapting that to my own work, and uh, uh, I sort of like to meld the uh, two styles together, American comics with manga, and just create my own look. I like that. That's, that's, uh, I love that. That's awesome. Um, what, what, what about manga you know, you said you like the style and everything. What about that style was like drew you to it? What was it that was so different? Well, when when I originally was there, uh, the first thing I noticed that the, the comics were in black and white. You know, manga wasn't printed in, in color, which made it unusual. Uh, and I don't uh, speak or read the language. So what drew me was the fact that I could uh, uh, take these comics and uh follow the story without understanding any of the language. Now, uh, that's what really impressed me most because uh, I could actually make up my own story and it'd be pretty close, you know, to what the original story would be. So I was mostly fascinated by their storytelling ability, you know, and that they were able to, uh, I was able to follow more or less what was going on without understanding any of the language. You know, so it really, uh, like American comics, which are very dialogue heavy. uh, And unless you uh, uh, can speak or understand, uh, read the language, uh, you'd be totally lost on an American, typical American (laughs) comic. Wow, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. That is awesome. Wow. So that, that really, so not only are they not using color, but right. So, so the contrast is probably a little bit different as well. Uh, that's fascinating. That's awesome. Yeah, that would draw me in as well. So you're able to sort of create your own dialogue in a way that matches maybe the well, facial expression or what's happening. I don't know how something. close uh, it matched it, but in my head, I can yeah, yeah. my own story. Totally, know? totally. <clears throat> I love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you decided, okay, I want to bring what what I've already been doing with something that I'm inspired by now and start creating, you know, this whole thing. So is this where, cause we got to talk about this, right? Is this where warrior nun came from? 
Is this uh, where th- this whole sparked from? <laughs> More or less. Uh, I had actually uh, uh, sort of did a prototype character in my uh, a previous comic book called Ninja High School. And I decided that uh, I would go ahead and ex- uh, take that and expand upon the storyline. Um, back in the early 90s, um, a trend was a- appearing in comics called the bad girl trend. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I, I read about I, I read about it. I didn't know about it, but I read about it. Just re- yes, read about it. It was starting to become very prevalent in the early 90s. Um, and of course, 90s comics started to become more extreme. Uh, more over sexualized, more uh, violent, you know, because it just seemed that was the direction in comics were going. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that I decided to do is still just creating another bad girl, I went the opposite direction and created a good girl, you know. So, uh, <laughs> <I like laughs> uh, it. Uh, of course, uh, it had all the tropes of nine typical 90s comics, you know. Uh, but uh, it seemed to uh, hit off pretty well with audiences, and I just uh, took it from there. You just kept kept going and going, and look, look where we are. It's 2020, right? Show <laughs> on Netflix. It gets picked up by Netflix. Uh, I'm sure everybody's watched the show. Was number one um, internationally, right, and and nationally here too. Uh, shot in Spain, which I love. I lived in Spain for years. My wife is from Spain. I have a lot of connection to Spain. I did the Camino de Santiago. Oh, People hear me talk. Country. It's awesome, right? It's a beautiful mm-hmm. country. Um, I miss it. My wife's there actually there right now uh, with her family uh, during COVID. Um, oh, wow. So, yes, a beautiful oh, country. Right. People, yeah, it's yeah, it's a tough situation. Uh, I try not to talk about it too much on the podcast, but yeah, it's a tough situation. But um, yeah, I talk about Spain all the time on the podcast. So when I saw that y'all were filming there, you got to you got to go too. They were sh- I was watching, you know, behind the scenes stuff. They were shooting in Malaga. I used to live in Andalusia, so I lived in uh, Granada for for years uh, in that area. I love Malaga. Love just loved everything about this man. This is just like just such a cool. So yeah, so let's talk about it. So we got the 90s, you, you write this story and it, it takes quite a journey, right? To get where audiences now are seeing it who may not even know about the comics, right? I, I hope that people find out about both because I think sure. one helps you understand uh, the other. So yeah, I'm curious about this journey, um, you know, how it got to this point of, of being picked up by Netflix and also congratulations uh, season two was announced in August. So just well, thank awesome. you very much. That's awesome. Well, it, it was a long journey. You know, I, the, the thing about it is that uh, I really uh, um, wanted to expand on the uh, the universe that she was in, you yeah. know, take it to uh, new places. Uh, the fact that it was very successful for us, uh, for Antarctic Press, uh, really made us to really exploit as many stories as we could. And we hired a lot of top talent to to expand the, the series. Um, and then uh, back in the early 2000s, I got a, a call from a, uh, a producer named Dean English, who uh, had a small company who did a couple of films and wanted to pick up the rights, uh, the film and TV rights. And uh, it took him a long time, but he finally got it done. <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> How was that phone call, getting that first phone call? Was that exciting? Yeah, was that like... I was very excited, yes. We tried, attempted to do sell a pilot. Uh, we produced our own uh, one-minute pilot animation in hopes that we could sell it as a series. Oh, and really? Is that out yeah. in the internet somewhere where people can yeah, see it, that it, pilot? Yeah, it's on YouTube. You can easily uh, Google it and find it. It's very easy to find. Uh, awesome. We uh, produced it and we shopped it. Uh, around Hollywood and went uh, visited actually several studios uh, and none of them picked it up because they just didn't understand the concept or they just thought it would be too controversial or they just didn't uh, uh, feel that it was their fit, you know? Yeah. So, you know, that, so, so we didn't end up selling it, but apparently word got out and that's how Dean English got a uh, hold of me and he was able to pull it off after 19 years. <laughs> That's sometimes so things crazy. like this take a long time because, you know, just sometimes the right set of circumstances comes into play and it just happens. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you're patient and you're staying with it and you're dedicated, right? And you don't give up. And that's just such a theme in life, period, uh, for, for sure. What, what was the conversation like 
uh, with him about, okay, how do we bring this story to the screen? Because, well, you know, I, it is a little different, right? I mean, there's differences uh, between them. So, well, absolutely. And originally, uh, Dean wanted to do a film version of it. And ah, he uh, uh, okay. actually wanted to stick very close to the actual uh, comic book in the look and feel. Yeah. And yeah. so he hired, uh, um, you know, hired someone to do a script and he did a sizzle reel, uh, which he actually produced. Uh, and uh, uh, apparently, but it was not getting anywhere. No one seemed to be picking up on it. So he asked uh, a friend of his, Simon Barry, who was a showrunner, uh, who did uh, a couple of TV episodes, I mean, a couple of TV shows. Um, and I think the one he's most famous, I uh, uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but he's done a couple of uh, TV series. So uh, Simon p uh, helped uh, Dean uh, develop it and uh, got picked up by Netflix and that's uh, where it went from there oh my gosh yeah <laughs> that is just I, I've heard that Netflix is just a great company to develop with um, oh well I wouldn't know about that but uh, I mean I've heard stories but uh, but I was there they seem to be treated they treated me pretty nicely um, they are very uh, what they were called um, uh, I would say they would probably be very uh, efficient. <laughs> yeah, efficient. Good word. Good word. I like it. That that's the new uh, that's the new way probably in filmmaking and and the way it's going, uh, especially now, right? With everything. Oh, happening. absolutely. absolutely. Right? Uh, so you got to go to the set, right? You got to fly out to Spain. I saw a picture of you standing next to uh, a badass motorcycle. <laughs> just like it was just the most badass motorcycle you look so happy man i can't tell you the face you had you just look so happy i just thought man that that's a that's somebody's dreams coming true right there oh, that's so inspiring I, right i mean i was ecstatic i mean it was just one of those things where you know you're seeing a creation that you work so long and hard come to uh come to fruition and they were so kind to, to fly me out there to uh, witness the, sh the first day of shooting and to meet the cast and the crew. And it was just a tremendous, tremendous experience. You know, I loved every minute of it and uh, hoping that uh, they'll do the same thing for the next season. Uh, <laughs> I know they're hard at work. They're hard at work on uh, the scripting. And yeah. uh, if all goes well, depending on how things go uh, with the bug, uh, they should start hopefully filming uh, next year's next spring. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, Spain is, they're going back and forth uh, on opening and closing and this and that it's, it's a, <laughs> it's been a tough, it, it's been a tough thing. They're actually my, let's see if I get this right. My wife's cousin. So I don't know what that would be to me. Um, he's an actor there in Spain. So he works like on a nationally, televised show there and they're they've been on break since and that there, there, wow. there's no yeah he hasn't talked about them going he's in fact went back to his hometown right where he grew up right where where my wife Vanessa is as well um mm -hmm. and yeah they haven't gone back to work yet um and he said wow. he doesn't he doesn't know when uh they're gonna because he, he lives in Madrid they, they shoot in Madrid they you know they film there and everything um so hopefully <laughs> by next <Gosh>. year <laughs> yes yes I, I think that's a good well, as soon as you said next year because I, I was honestly thinking you said well in the next couple of weeks i thought oh i don't know if that's going to happen uh, but i'm glad you said <laughs> i'm yeah, glad you said they, next year i think uh, they're, that, they're still working on the scripts that there you go so they have to wait till they get approval to start working on the scripts or do you start working a little ahead of time just well once place? i think once they uh once they announce a second season officially I think that gives them, you know, clearance to go ahead and start working on the, the series. Um, I'm not sure how exactly things work as far as that's concerned, but uh, yeah. I would assume that uh, they would get started right away, you know, do their stories, uh, meetings and everything else like that, you know, just to get everything done. Because like I said, you know, you don't have the story, you don't have anything. So uh, that has to be the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Ha were you happy? I mean, I know you said, you know, you went to the set, you met everybody. This, I just love that story, by the way. Um, but were, were you, you know, when you see the show, right, and you watch it, I know you're, you're happy. I mean, I know you're happy with it. But was there anything you would have said, you know what, I wish they would have maybe brought this in for my story, or I wish they would have maybe stuck this in or something like that? Well, um, 
I mean, I know that what works in comics does not necessarily work in real life. So yeah. I mean, when I'm able to do a comic, I'm not limited by budget. I'm not limited by, you know, anything as far as uh, creative control is concerned. I just basically just go all out and do whatever the heck I want, you know, and I say, well, this works for the story. I'll just go ahead and do this. But I understand the, the limitations of doing anything in live action, especially if you're going to do something, you know, that you want people to take seriously. You know, do you want people to enjoy? You want to reach all sorts of uh, uh, audience, you know? And uh, I was actually very pleased. It really captured, you know, the least the tone and the feel of the original comic book. Um, I mean, I know very well that if they had pranced around in the original comic book version of their 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 uniforms, uh, it would be come out as very campy, over the top, you know, yeah. and treated very silly, you know, and uh, uh, I understood that the tack they took was something that, uh, I mean, they they have way more experience in things like this than I ever could. You know, I'm just a comic book writer and artist, you know, I've never made a TV series or a movie, so I just trusted to them that uh, they knew what they were doing, and I think they pulled it off very well. Yeah, I mean, this show's, you know, phenomenal for sure. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. Um, you know, there's a lot of comic books being turned into shows now, I feel like. Um, and it's become this big thing over the past, I don't know, what would you say, 10 years, maybe 12 years, right? Since Iron, or I don't know, Iron Man, did that really start it? Or I know Batman always did well, but well, it's kind of yeah, unique, right? Books, I mean, yeah, comic books have been adapted into other media for a long time. You know, sure. it just have been only recently that I've noticed there's a huge plethora. I think a lot of it's to do with the streaming, you know, where people are looking for content, you know. And right now, yeah. uh, what better way to look at, you know, new and unusual content is than the comic book industry. Because uh, if you think about it, comic books are already basically storyboarded, you know, movies. <laughs> yeah. made. You know, I That's mean, you have the point. pictures, you have the... Uh, the story, everything is down. You know, you got beginning, middle, and end. All really you have to do is just take the concept and uh, adapt it to the to the screen. You know, um, it's not like a, a novel where you have uh, uh, just the words describing, so they can be just about anything. Of course, it gives you a little bit more flexibility. You know, as far as how things are going to look. But you know, it's never uh, the thing about a novel is that it's never going to meet up the expectations of the reader who already has an idea of what the characters are going to look like, how they're going to be. And comics books are a little bit uh, more easily adaptable because, like you say, you already have the visuals, you already have the tone and everything else like that. And I'm just happy to see that uh, so many comic books uh, are becoming you know, movies and TV shows. That's just an amazing uh, aspect of the whole medium. You know, and I, I, I hope it continues. I agree completely. Um, is the boys that's on Amazon, is that comic book based or graphic novel based? As far as I know, it is. It started off as a comic and, uh, uh, and that's, that's basically, I have never read yeah. the comic, so I don't know how close it is. Uh, but, uh, I have been watching the show and it's quite interesting. Yeah. It's a crazy show. I mean, for sure. Uh, <laughs> it's a totally uh, nuts, uh, show. Um, yeah, what, what other, uh, it wasn't, the, isn't The Walking Dead also, right? A comic, wasn't that based on uh, Yeah, it's thing? absolutely Walking Dead. And what's interesting is that Walking Dead actually was uh, originally sold as a science fiction series to get it to be picked up by uh, Dark Horse, I mean, Image Comics. And uh, because Image Comics at the time didn't think a zombie comic would sell. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's yeah, crazy. it's strange but true. That is crazy. That's zombie cell, right? That's like uh, well, they, I mean, they did back then. I mean, but uh, the yeah, thing guess, about it is that zombies and comics have never had a really good run. To be honest, there've been zombie comics in the past, but they just never really hit off. Uh, yeah. But uh, Walking Dead definitely uh, connected with an audience, and uh, it is a testament to uh, to the creator, you know, Robert Kirkman, who did a great job uh, on the series and. I can see why it was picked up and uh, turned into a TV show. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, I actually don't watch the show too much. I watched it in the beginning. I remember when it first came out, the first couple seasons, and I just drifted off. That's why I like Netflix and uh, all the new series, because it's really just, I don't know, maybe three, four seasons, five top, and then it's done. we move on. <laughs> we'll get something out. I like that, I, you know, in a way, except for yeah. yours. I hope they just take yours, you know, for, huh. forever. 
Well, someone <laughs> mentioned that, you know, uh, someone had mentioned that they should go to the weekly release model instead of the binge model. And uh, I think there's some credence to that. I think that if uh, if shows actually released on a weekly uh, basis, it would actually, uh, I think, uh, keep uh, uh, the audience longer. Yeah, that's a good point. That's like a big thing right now that has changed. And in fact, speaking of the boys, that's something they tried on the second season differently from the first season. They released the first three episodes and then every Friday they're releasing an episode. You might be right. Maybe that Well, maybe I think it's started work. with the, the Mandalorian started that trend. Yeah. You know? I think that the true. boys sort of followed that trend too. And I think oh, that yeah. uh I think that as long as uh uh you know, it keeps people's interest. I think it might be something to, uh, for the streaming services to consider, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure for Netflix, they're sort of set in their ways. It may be a while for them to decide, well, we'll, we'll follow the weekly model because they like to set their own agenda uh, for the most part. But, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. They'll probably wait, taking a wait and see attitude, see how things go. Sure. I think maybe for some shows it works well and for others, maybe you, you know, you binge it. They, they really, I think it's, I think it works I think, well for right? any show that's episodic. You know, if you have a yeah. show that's episodic, you know, especially with a continuing storyline, I think that works best, you know, and uh, uh, I, it's, it's <laughs> what's ironic is that uh, we thought the binge model would to replace the episodic uh, show for like regular free TV back in the yeah. day. You know, now we're going back to this, <laughs> <Old model again. laughs> that's hilarious yeah it's about like you said keeping people engaged building the audience more i mean that's still that never goes away that goal so yeah. you know i get it i mean it does keep you more right you're talking about that episode for the week right now you're you're waiting for that to you come time up. to absorb it it's your time to yeah. digest it you know to take yeah. a look through it and, and talk about it you know and yeah then, uh, then make speculation as the next uh, next week's episode. That's, I think, the biggest point right there. Make speculation about what's to come. That's what people love to talk about, right? Oh, they want yeah, the, yeah, the theories and the conspiracy, right? Any anything that they and I get it. That's that keeps you. That's a big. That's almost a bigger part of the show than the actual show. Yeah, and, and it's right. sort of fits in the comic book mode too, because you know we do comics monthly. You know, and uh, it'd be almost the same. Well, we're just going to go ahead and release all 12 issues at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Yeah. Here you go. You yeah. <laughs> so what do you got to sell for the rest of the year, right? <laughs> that's a good, wow, that's a good point. Yeah, just like an encyclopedia, just you get it all uh, at once. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting uh, for sure. You know what I thought is, I think um, Zack Snyder, right? I saw that Sucker Punch movie. I don't know when it came out, but but many years ago. That style seemed to, was in my head when I was thinking about, you know, your comic book and seeing the show. And I thought, man, Zack Snyder should have done this. He, he could. <laughs> he oh, visually, it was, it was very interesting. You know, I thought yeah. that, uh, if this was a comic book, uh, it, would, it would sell really well. Um, the, again, the problem I saw was that I wasn't very engaged with the story or the characters. It just seemed very, hundred um, percent. Uh, uh, it just seemed really strange to me. But visually, I mean, it was it, a perfect. Yeah. It was a comic book movie all the way. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Visually, um, even watching the the Batman movies, right? The Batman versus Superman, and well, I don't want to say Justice League because they're releasing his his version out, which I'm excited to see. But even that, it, it just has this comic book field to way that he frames things and does things and i like that well, it is I mean, different he, my my understanding is that he is a big fan of comic books i mean one of the, yeah. his biggest first uh successes was adapting frank miller's 300 you know and yeah. uh before that, that dawn of the dead he did the he did dawn of the dead um speaking of zombies that, that was the <laughs> first movie i saw of his right before 300 uh it's called oh uh, yeah his. Oh, it's awesome. Well, so, you know, you got to start somewhere. And, you know, the yeah. thing about it is that uh, uh, even Don and Dan was, was, a, was a great zombie movie. You know, 300 was a great uh, movie. Oh, 300. Uh, you so know, it's, 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 so, it's, it's obvious that uh, comic books are becoming a big influence in modern day pop culture. Yeah. The, the, the problem is, is that uh, it's hard for people to get comic books these days. You know, nobody, uh, nobody actually reads, or at least not too many people actually read them anymore. You know, it's great for source material, 
But as far as the selling to the general audience, uh, it just hasn't hit. That's crazy. So it's like, yeah, people love taking it, adapting it, turning it into a show or a movie, but the actual source, not too many people are getting behind. That's, uh, that's crazy. So like it, when you go to comic, I've never been to Comic Con. Have you ever been to a Comic Con before? Do they? Oh, many. I've been to many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, what are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> so they sell, oh, com- yeah. they sell comic books there, right? Like physical. Oh, absolutely. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I love buying back issues, you know, of comic books because you know there's hundreds of millions of comics. You know, there's no way anybody could read every single one in a lifetime. So there's a lot of good material out there. You know, a lot of material that uh, uh, has a lot of potential. You know, it's just a matter of just getting the the material out there to the readers. What are your favorite comics to read? To, uh, I'm sure our uh, listeners or your fans would be curious to know what what do you read in comics? Uh, currently, I don't read anything new. I'm not really much into the new material as far as that's concerned. It just really doesn't interest me that much. I read a lot of old material. I like to read a like a, a gold and silver age horror comics, and I like to read science. Gold and Silver uh, science fiction comics, the old superhero comics. I, I love reading the old Marvels and DCs, you know, because they're just, they, the people, uh, the creators back then, they knew how to tell a story in a limited amount of space. And I think that's quite, uh, to me, uh, impactful because a lot of writers these days feel like they have to draw a story out for a really long time and take two or three issues that can be probably said in a couple of pages in a regular comic book (laughs) and it just uh and you know the subject matter for the most part really doesn't attract me that much because it's all very dark and dystopian you know and very uh uh they're just not fun you know and uh it's 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 hard for me to get into a you know i can only read so many you know dark and moody and you know a violent comics uh, before i decide yeah well i've had my fill of that uh, it's time for me to read a nice goofy you know superman comic book you know or you know lex Luthor and superman were brothers at one time or so or something like that so what well uh, I, I i just prefer the old material because yeah. the people back then they knew their craft and they were very uh they knew they were writing for a certain audience and they did it well i love that that's awesome that's all i love that that is so cool. Who, who, um, who are, uh, uh, what do you call artists that you look up to? Are there any oh, artists? Gosh. <laughs> you have all day. <laughs> <laughs> Top three. Yeah, I, was, I don't uh, know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, as far as a uh, comic strip artist, I, I yeah. love Carl Schutz. I read him all the time. Uh, but as far as comic book, oh my gosh, saw the classic character, Jack Kirby. Uh, which I didn't care much for at first, but as I got older, I appreciated his work a lot more. Uh, Jim Steranko, Neil Adams, Barry Smith, you know, all those guys, they were great influences on me. And then uh, when I went to uh, uh, Asia, I discovered Japanese artists like Go Nagai and Leiji Matsumoto and Rumiko Takahashi and all those others. You know, so it was, uh, to me, I just like good comic book art. If I see something by somebody that uh, it attracts my eye, I'll say, wow, that's really good. I, I think I'm going to steal that, the way he draws that eye or, or the way he draws his hands or something like that and try to incorporate uh, it in my own work. I love that. Okay, so that's, I was just going to, I was curious about that. Like when you look at a, a piece, right? A, what is exactly, is it mo- the movement or an eye or a hand? I love that. Okay, so you like, oh, okay, I like the way he draws his eye. Or a, the artist, you know, yeah, like that's the cool. You know, so that's why I like looking at Marvel or DC comics in black and white as opposed to in color, because I can see the line work, <clears throat> see how they did it, you know, yeah, try to right. guess what kind of pen they use, what kind of brush they use, you know, what kind of wow. technique they use. I mean, that's wow. really the best way to, uh, to to see what works. You know, it's wow. almost like taking apart a radio or a, a gadget, yeah. and, you know, looking at the insides and see, oh, so that's what makes that work. <laughs> That is super cool. That is just, do you think, look, I'm a whore, you know, do, how, how did you find out you could draw? How, how did uh, that come across? Or did you have to pick it, you know, practice? 
Well, when I was a kid, I, I loved reading comics. You know, there wasn't really that much to do, really, back in the late 60s, early 70s. You know, the, 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 our entertainment options were limited. And uh, <laughs> I loved reading the newspaper strips because that's uh, uh, we got the newspaper delivered to our house every day. My father loved reading, uh, was reading newspaper, and I was always get the comic strips, read them. And then I started reading uh, comic books. My uh, parents would buy me comics every once in a while, I guess, just to shut me up or to keep me busy. You know, but that's fine. I liked it because the comics, they, they were great. I, and I started copying them. You know, I started drawing my own comics. And then uh, as I grew older and older, I, I, and I started collecting them, you know, really reading them and digesting them. And then as I got older, I decided, you know what, this is something I would like to do. So, uh Back in, after I got out of uh, high school, I started my uh, own company and uh, has been doing it ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, uh, uh, was it Antarctic Press? Is that right? Yeah, I right? started the Antarctic Press in 1985. And we've been doing it ever since. That is just, I love that, man. That is just awesome. Wow. That's a, dude, this is, this is awesome. This is just such an inspiring story for people to hear, to think, you know, right? Just, yeah, uh, yeah, you're what right. You love. Yeah. The important thing that you said was that you shouldn't give up, you know, I mean, yeah. if it's something you want to pursue, you should pursue it, you know, no matter what it takes. I mean, I mean, I would, I would be lying to you if it was all smooth sailing. Uh, no, we've <laughs> had, uh, in our, in our 35 years of publishing, I tell you, we've had our rough spots and, you know, we survived the, the black and white bus, the black and white boom and bus. We survived the nineties implosion. You know, we, we, we survived the 2000 recession. I mean, it was just, you know, there were a lot of times we thought, oh, we're just, we're just not going to make it this year. But somehow we managed to uh, do what was needed to stay afloat, to keep uh, things viable. And uh, we're just doing everything we can to, you know, continue doing comics the best way we can. That's awesome. Yeah, that's it. You got to stick with it. Because now it is, it's just like the most massive thing now to do comic books. I mean, it's just like, yeah, it's, right, it's, it's ironic just, because the comic book awareness is at an all-time high, but comic book readership is at an all-time yeah. low. Yeah, it just, like you it said. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's, I think one of the things is that I think a lot of people, uh, I think it's probably the the distribution system and the presentation. You know, it's just, there should be, uh, the comic publishers need to know who their audience is and then try to sell to that audience in a specific way. You know? Uh, but I think the biggest problem is, is that the distribution, it used to be that you could run to the corner drugstore and you could buy comics, you know, and the kids would yeah. just, you know, and it was cheap yeah. enough where it would be an impulse buy, you know, yeah. as opposed to, oh my gosh, four or $5. That's a major purchase. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's a good point. You're making, these are like practical points you're making, right? These are like actual uh, pr points, you know, maybe there should, maybe somebody should come up with something like comic books for Netflix where you, you have a subscription and you can trade around all these different comic books. So you're only paying like 10 or 15 bucks a month or something, but you get access to, right, just so many different comic books. I don't know. I Maybe they, it already I exists. Sort of, I don't know. I think they sort of do that with the digital comics. You know, you can oh, okay. sort of like that. Uh, physical comics are a little bit harder because uh, you don't know you're, you're, you're subject to the whims of a printer and the distribution and the shipping. So, but with... Um, Digital, it's almost immediate. So you can get yeah. it. And that's the thing about streaming also. It's, it's immediate. You know, that's so true. Then, uh, uh, it's a lot harder to convince someone, well, uh, to pay up up front for a certain amount of books that you may be getting, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. But, you know, I, I think that really, I mean, the, the thing about it is just distribution. I can, I'd like to see comics in movie theaters when they open up. Yeah. You know, maybe comic book vending machines, you know, comic books. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah. The vending machine. That's a great idea. I even think that there might be a possibility of the print-on-demand machines can get small enough. They could actually be in, you know, comic book stores or in stores where you basically just punch uh, a book you want to have printed. It'll print it right in front of you and just pop it out, you know, wow. right there. That, that would be amazing. <laughs> that that really would. You probably people would just go to get to see that made. You'd have to be able to see it being made for that to work, for that to be cool. Sure. Because right, otherwise it'd be like, damn it, what's going on in there? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, that, well, that's a great, those are both great ideas. Okay, people, whoever's listening, let's, let's get on this. Let's, uh, let's. <laughs> well, I don't think the technology is, uh, is caught up yet, but I think it'd be kind of a cool thing to, to have if, it, if they could ever pull that off. 
Absolutely. Well, I love that you want to get people, you know, I, I love that you love that comic books are out there and that they're making movies, about, but the core of it, right? The, the realness of it. I love that you still want people to read the comic books because that's well, where... Well, I mean, uh, right? the thing is that people are actually, a lot of people are actually reading comics, you know, they're just not willing to pay for it. <laughs> I mean, if, you, <laughs> if you get them to read, you can get millions of people to read a comic without any problem. It's free. You know, uh, the, tr the trick is, is to get them to actually pay for it. Now, um, I always use the example of comic strips. I mean, back when we were reading newspapers, comic strips yeah. were free. They were part of the newspaper. Yeah. But people were still willing to buy the collections. I mean, I mean, I mean, Charles Schutz probably, you know, made a bundle. I mean, uh, just selling the uh, collections of his peanut strips. I mean, even Calvin and Hobbes, which hasn't seen print in the newspaper for decades, still sells. You know, the, the books yeah. will sell, you know, even though people got to read that comic strip for free. So it's just, uh, uh, I think that, uh, I think one of the models is to, is to give your comics for free and then offer it in a physical format later on down the line. There you go. That's a, that's a good business model there. I like that. I, you know what? I also read, Ben, I don't want to forget this, that you had worked on sc a Scanner Darkly. Yes, that true? I, was one of right. the I was one of the grunt animators on Scanner. Wow, because that film, when did that come out? Like 2006 or something? I can't really uh, remember. Something I mean, like that, yeah, back in the mid-2000s. Right, think that yeah. Been, uh, I mean, it was ahead of its time, right? I mean, this was a, a, I remember seeing it thinking, this is unbelievable, right? This is like, how are they doing this? It was uh, pretty so trippy. <laughs> so that was you, you know, creating this look. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, well, one, of, I was one of part of. Yeah, I was. I was just a, a, a low-level team, you know, a member out of a group of several teams who were, you know, tasked for handling certain things. I did mostly a lot of the grunt work. Um, there was a specific teams to handle the uh, animation for the actors and actresses. I did a lot of background and, uh, um, you know, mostly environmental type material. Um, and so, but you know, that's, Hey, I didn't mind. It needed to be done. Someone had Absolutely. to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> of course. Are you kidding me? It's awesome. You're watching the movie. You're like, that's my teacup right over there. <laughs> I, I, right. That's my wall back there. Guys. That's right. That's, that's I, right. I would be, I mean, I just think that's awesome. Did you get to meet, um, Richard Linkletter by any chance? I mean, yeah, I, it's, I don't yeah, it's after the, we, uh, he threw a, a little, a party for all the animators at his house. We got to go there and hang out and just talk and, uh, it was very, very, very interesting and uh, I had a great time. That's awesome. Yeah, I love him. He's a phenomenal director. I would love to get him on the podcast, actually. We've, I think we've reached out. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just that's a great movie. You know, so, just put that aside. But I just read that note and I thought, wow, that is so, uh, I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah, Have it's great. Been, yeah, right? it's great because he's a Texas filmmaker, just like yep. Rodriguez is. And yep. I think now that with the uh, uh, COVID, the way it is is Hollywood is shut down. I think the Texas should reach out and say, Hey, Hollywood, you know, bring all your stuff to Texas. We can, we can, you can start your own film making stuff here. You know, we've got everything you need, you know, and I think that uh, Texas uh, could very easily be the next uh, land to where people can make films. You know, there, there's, there's no rule that says you have to live in California to make TV shows and movies, you know, and absolutely. Uh, they should reach out and say, hey, you know, we'll give you good tax incentives. We'll give you a little land. You just come on over, move your studios over. And I bet you I'll get, there'd be some serious people would think about that. I love, I mean, that's a great idea. Yeah, Robert Rodriguez has his big studio here. They mm -hmm. could easily just start adding all around what they're doing. I mean, uh, Tyler Perry built a big studio out in Atlanta, massive Mm -hmm. Just this massive studio. So you're right. I mean, people shooting shows. Yeah, you're all not, over the place, you're not so. limited by geography yeah. anymore, as far as doing right. that is concerned. You know, you just go where the best deal is. You know, yeah. and you can get your production started. And uh, uh, it, I mean, it, you didn't. You don't have to be beholden anymore to one uh, location. Yep, love that, man. I, that's a great idea. I definitely love that. Would love uh, more of that to come and it would bring a lot to Texas for sure. Uh, we definitely got land. Well, there's uh, the thing right. about, I love about Texas is the talent. There's a ton of talent here. I mean, I see artists and animators and filmmakers. I mean, there's a ton of uh, great talent here, and we need to foster our own homegrown material because I think that uh, 
with the build availability of the YouTube and the internet and streaming services and stuff like that, people are hungry for content. You know, they yeah. want to be entertained. And I think yeah. there's a good possibility that if you create material that will entertain people, you will achieve, you know, success. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm totally behind that, man. Let's hope somebody hears that. It's like, you know what? Let's, let's, Hey, look, uh, Joe Rogan's come in here, right? There's a lot. He's bringing a, one of the biggest podcasts in the entire world to Austin, right? There, so there That's is, awesome. yeah. it, there's going to be a lot of things coming to text. I mean, companies are moving here like crazy. At least, we're, you know, you're in San Antonio or where, where are you at right now? I, I'm just uh, outside there. of Dallas. I live in, uh, uh, oh, really? Right I'm in Garland. <laughs> oh, no. Sh I grew up in, uh, I grew up in the Dallas area, actually. Um, the oh, cool. Well, like uh, Grapevine, Colleyville. Um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm originally a San Antonio guy. Uh, I only moved up here just the last uh, 20 years. But yeah. for the better part of my life, I was in San Antonio. Yeah, beautiful. San and boy, San Antonio is changing, man. Finally, San Antonio is, is getting some much needed care uh, and love. Uh, I always say it's the, it's the biggest small town you can go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I've always loved San Antonio, man. It's such a great city. But Dallas, was, I lived in Garland. I think I, I think we lived, when, when my wife and I moved back from Spain, I think we lived in Garland for like six months, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because it's just right outside of Dallas there. And I worked downtown at a, for Stephen Piles at a restaurant there. It's uh, <laughs> nice. Know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely San Antonio is the place for breakfast tacos. <laughs> Well, ooh, I don't know. You just started a fight, Ben, because Austin is supposedly... Yeah, you, can't, you can't go anywhere else but San Antonio for the best breakfast tacos. And believe me, I've been all over this state, and I've yet to find a place better than San Antonio. That's good. Boy, that is a fight there. I've, I've done, I actually did a breakfast taco. I stand taco. by it. I, I love it. I love this. I did a, I did a, taco comp a breakfast taco competition with trucks from San Antonio, like, you know, in all good fun, right? That's the argument. I love it. I love it. That's, that's great. Uh, but, but he's right, people. Listen to You're going to get a, gr a phenomenal breakfast taco in San Antonio, uh, for sure. Um, oh, okay, Ben, before we go, I know there's one more thing I wanted to ask you. Sure. Uh, before, let's see here. Did we, oh, okay. So I'm, I don't know if you've gotten this question before, but I'm curious. Um, so I was a big fan of the Kill Bill movies. I mean, I still am when they came out. It, that, the animation that's in, I think it's the first one or maybe the second one. I don't, one I yeah. It's the first one, right? Yeah. What, what, what style of that is that of animation that's in there? Is that anime? Or what, and what does that mean? Well, uh, yes, it's commonly referred to as anime. Basically, and that has nothing certain, to do with comic books, right? Uh, it's, there is a symbiotic relationship. A lot of anime comes out of manga um, because uh, that's where a lot of the source material comes from. Uh, anime is basically just a shortened version of the word animation. I think it's okay. most, mostly just a Japanese uh, version of the word animation and it used uh, in a way just to make it easier to identify. Now, it's come to the point where among the uh, aficionados of things like that, they use it to distinguish between what is traditionally um, American or Western animation with Japanese animation, which they refer to as anime. So anything referred to as anime is basically meaning that, oh, it's done in sort of a Japanese style of animation, which at the, at the beginning it was because it was very, you know, uh, uh, simple, uh, very, uh, uh, it, it didn't have a lot of uh, uh, cell counts or the animation was very rough, you know, or limited. But uh, the definitely the Japanese anime industry has certainly gotten to the point where now it can compete regularly internationally with any of the best animation studios out there. I mean, like Studio Ghibli uh, definitely would be considered anime, but a lot of people don't really look at it as anime. They actually look at it as uh, legitimate you know, real, you know, animation. Okay. Okay. Is, is there any, what's, is there any popular anime that most people know? Is there something like super, I don't know. I, well, the thing about anime is that it, uh, in Japan, things come and go, you know, because of the popularity of certain things. We, sure. uh, I mean, there are, uh, every year there's something new that comes out or runs its course, you know, and then there's something new comes along. 
Um, but uh, I, I grew up in the, I mean, I, I, grew, I was a very big fan of the 70s and 80s anime, which I consider some of the best anime, you know, or at least some of the, the material, the subject matter is probably the best uh, that's produced. I mean, definitely anime has gotten slicker, you know, and the use of computers and stuff has made it a little bit better. Um, but story-wise, I mean, it's really hard to compete with the 70s and 80s anime, you know. Um, <clears throat> But uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, I, I just think it's, it's also one of those things that sort of slowly creep, creeped into the mindset of a lot of uh, the pop culture. So now a lot of uh, just regular folks, they recognize Pokemon, they recognize, you know, Sailor Moon. I mean, they know all those characters. Oh, okay. So Pokemon is anime. I didn't, I don't know. I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh. It's, it's anime is one of the longest running animes, you know, of all time. Oh, okay. Is Akira... Is, am I saying that right? Is that yes. anime? Also considered anime, yes. Because I've read that that's... I, ha, I just have this friend that he is really into that, for sure. I mean, just big time into that. So that's like a dark one, right? Like, like That's like a dark it's anime. It's dystopian. That, I mean, it was dystopian. based on a manga that came out in the 80s. And oh, okay. Marvel actually did an adaptation. I mean, actually did a reprint of the original manga, but they did decide to do it in color. So it uh, <laughs> didn't turn ah. out the way it could have been. But, interesting wow yeah you add color in what do you do yeah, who makes changes. who makes those choices it changes the whole look you know sure sure absolutely i, I would just be curious who who decides the colors right like who decides well that's a red dress right <laughs> and not a yellow or whatever well somebody somebody at marvel decided yeah that <laughs> i don't know that's a big those are big choices to be making uh, right absolutely i mean that's everything well, look, Ben, I've had, uh, this has just been just phenomenal, man. I just can't tell you, I could just talk, I could, I'm, I'm sure I annoy the hell out of you with all these questions, but um, I just find this so fascinating, man. I just appreciate your openness and honest. I know a lot of our listeners and stuff are going to learn uh, just like I did um, about all this stuff. So, well, you know, we'll my get, pleasure. My get pleasure. more people Anytime. to buy some comic books. Absolutely. Anytime. You just let me know. No, that's awesome, Ben. And look, again, I, I, you know, let's check out the show on Netflix, right? It's called War The Warrior Nun, right? right? Mm -hmm. Warrior Nun. Uh, the first season's already out, already got renewed. Uh, no spoilers, so we won't ruin anything for season one, but get there, watch it. And how can people check out your comic book that it's based on? Where can they go get that at? Tell us about that. Well, you, you can go to the Antarctic Press website, of course, um, and you can go to any of the lo your local comic book stores, and just uh, request the uh, Antarctic Press books, and it, they'll be more than happy to order it for you, I'm sure. How many comics are there for that particular? Is there a ton of comic books for, for that, uh, for the Warrior Nun? Oh, for Warrior Nun? Well, it's back issues wise, there's yeah. over 200 issues. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. Uh, yeah. And I know that the Avatar comics, they are putting out new Warrior Nun stories. Oh, got it. Okay, right on. Well, that's awesome. Uh, ben, what about like your social media? If you, I don't know if you want people to connect with you or, sure, or anything like that. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. You know, just look up the word Ben Dunn and you should be able to find me fairly easily. Um, I do have, a, I do have a, 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 a website, you know, which is basically Ben Dunn. Uh, 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 just look up Ben Dunn and you'll be able to find it without any problem. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Ben, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate um, you taking the time today and, and talking to us um, and just explaining a lot of this stuff to, to me and our, our listeners um, and our viewers, whoever sees this as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for your time, man. It was really just an absolute pleasure. And my best to you on, on season two and everything. And we'll get you back on. Uh, about, well, I tell everyone we'll, we'll have you back on um, for sure. Um, well, thank you. you know, we'll, talk, thank we'll talk more. And do you mind if I just plug one uh, project I'm working on right now? Please, Ben, of course. You plug anything you want, brother. All right. Well, I do have a, a, a Ninja High School uh, yearbook collection that's now on Kickstarter. If you want to check it out, that's a great uh, little book, and it collects a lot of the Ninja High School material of the past. That's awesome. So how, how can – that's amazing, first of all. So, so they just go to Kickstarter and search Ninja, Ninja High School? High School, and you should be able to find it without any problem. Awesome. Okay, folks, you heard it there. Go to Kickstarter, type in Ninja High School. That sounds like an amazing uh, little thing there. Uh, that's awesome, Ben. Um, so Thank again, my, so my best to you and uh, your family as well through this whole time. You too. I wish you guys the best. So 
Well, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time. Yeah.